Welcome to Building the Future. I'm your host, Kevin Horick. You can check out the radio version of the show every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on WDJY 99.1 in Atlanta. We also air on a podcasting network in Los Angeles called the 405 Media. There's a TV version of the show that airs on KMVT 15 in Silicon Valley at 8 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday nights. Both versions of the show air in other states. For these show times plus past episodes, please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com. Join me at the 10th Annual Media Excellence Awards on January 18th in Beverly Hills, California. The attendees and I will be celebrating innovation and leadership in technology and entertainment. There are 20 award categories with 1,000 nominees. These awards honor those who are creating groundbreaking technology to better our lives and celebrate the hard work, determination, and brilliance in the leadership within the companies which create the new world we live in today. I will be recording nominees and winners at the awards. For tickets and more information, go to MediaXAwards.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Brooks Brown. He's the Global Director of VR at Starbreeze Studios. Brooks, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think what you're currently doing is is a personal kind of thing that I'm passionate about, the, the kind of VR space, and, and you've done a ton of work in it. You're doing a bunch of innovative stuff, but maybe before we kind of get into your kind of day-to-day global director VR role. Let's start off with getting to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Yeah, a little bit of time travel, I guess. Um, sure. Yeah, so I'm uh, originally from Colorado, uh, okay. just south of Denver, Austin, uh, famous for the uh, Columbine High School shooting, which uh, actually I was at, my friends were the killers. It was a whole awful experience in my life. Wow. Um, and one of the things that kind of came away from me with that uh, aside from kind of years of therapy and problems around that whole thing, sure. uh, you know, over time I started to realize that what happened to me, this crazy event, changed the way I viewed the world. It's a wonderful concept, and I spent a great deal of time trying to understand how that works and how to bring that to other people. And I was very fortunate. Uh, shortly after that, I got a chance to work with Michael Moore on Bowling for Columbine. Oh, very uh, cool. I uh, which, which was really, which was really fun and. You know, I, I love the world of documentary making, and then I started working with some bands, and I wrote a book. And but it was, you know, my my drive has always been to try to get people to feel empathy for people inside of different situations. Okay. And the difficulty with that, with a lot of traditional media, uh, and a lot of the way media has been done, is when someone watches a movie, they have paid for a ticket, and they kind of know what they're going to get. And what ends up happening is I'm watching this film and I'm already predisposed to whatever message it may have. Uh, sure. You don't see a lot of Trump voters going to Michael Moore films, I guess would be the way to put it. Sure, fair enough, yeah. So it's just the way things kind of work. And so I started trying to get into entertainment to try to figure out how to really give true emotional experiences to people. What can we actually you know, influence inside of a person's life? Uh, and video games for me always kind of became a natural fit, the concept of how we interact with things and how we play and how we explore worlds and how we do it through an avatar uh, always was just intriguing to me. Ultima Online was my first kind of mind-blowing experience in that where I truly role-played a character and I was an awful uh, player killer, just the guy on the server everyone hated, me and my group. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. We were, we were terrible. But, you know, that idea and then... You know, playing World of Warcraft, playing Counter-Strike, playing Dota, all these games and seeing myself represented through this, I found very, very powerful. So I started trying to get into games, did some games reviews. Uh, A guy named John Davison gave me my first sort of gig in the games industry, gave me my first break uh, doing game reviews for Barbie video games. Uh, Interesting. As it happens, you you kind of, uh, as it happens, you have to eat shit. It's kind of how every entertainment industry works. Sure. John was always good to me. Uh, and then uh, I ended up getting a gig at Lucasfilm, uh, writing for StarWars.com, and then I started doing web development. Wow. Uh, and that was my first kind of taste of being able to actually make games. Uh, my first big foray into that was Lego Star Wars 3. We got a chance to make a sort of Flash-based MMO, sure. uh, which was a really, really an amazing experience. 
it was an amazing experience to be able to play around with how people each other online uh, without communicating. How do we let them have communication and kind of playing inside of that space, especially with kids, because sure. kids are so incredibly inventive and they're easily to jive in and they, they just love and voraciously love to play. Sure. Uh, and that did well. I won a Webby and a whole bunch of awards for it. And that kind of earned my stripes, as they say, to kind sure. of move on and uh, had a couple other games that never saw the light of day, as tended to happen at Lucas back in the day. Sure. Um, and uh, then I was snapped up by uh, Kathy Franklin and John Landau and James Cameron to work on Avatar for four, four and a half years okay. um, and kind of build the digital, the digital footprint for the next few films. Uh, and uh, it was an extraordinary experience. I mean, it, it has to be. I, sure, I don't, yeah, I kind I of goes without saying the moment you say you work with, you work with people like that. Uh, I don't have to say that, but it, 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 it bears repeating. Um, one of the things that they have and the way that Jim and John and Kathy understand how people deal with worlds and how people deal with movies is it's not a movie. And it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a world. The movie is a window into a world. What you're actually building is the world around it, and you're giving people a chance to see this one tiny aspect of it. And that was always an interesting flip for me, because, you know, with Star Wars, it's very much the opposite. You build a story, you build characters, you build games, and that is the world that people are playing into. And it's a very different philosophy. And over the course of a few years, seeing how absolutely dedicated Jim and his team were to every little detail, and you can see it when you go to, like, uh, Pandora Land, Land, Pandora Land, which I know is not the name of it, uh, but it's the Disney World uh, Animal Kingdom and, uh, Avatar experience. Right, right. Just every little thing that they care about and how much they care about how this thing is interactive. Uh, there are interactive plants and things that look like they're alien, and then the way things are built and the angles and stuff. The care that goes into every detail is what gives you a chance to transport yourself. And as I was watching this, uh, it was right around the time that uh, Palmer Lucky was doing the Oculus Kickstarter. Sure, yeah. And that VR sort of VR sort of resurgence happened. And so I started, you know, basically trolling and sitting on sites, not commenting, because I'm not smart enough to be an engineer, but sort of watching what these guys were doing and trying to figure out, you know, how a person interacts in VR. And I started to see that same sort of rule but taken to a much crazier degree, where instead of the idea of, well, this thing's a window. It's like, no, you're putting me, the player, I'm the thing that's going. I'm not playing a character. I'm not playing an avatar. It's Brooks. Brooks is the dude who's walking around this world. And I started to see and put together this idea of, you know, that dream that I had always about how do we give people deeply emotional experiences? How do we connect with them? You know, the problem with film is we have this mediator, the, the screen that is always between us. And there's all these language tricks that... When you're watching a movie, you, you know how to feel based on how the angle of the camera is. And you don't really but, you know, any film crit major will tell you, no, they use Dutch angles for this reason, they use flat angles for this reason, it makes you feel this way. And it's because we've been trained over time. Sure. And with video games, it's not far off from that. There's a language to video games. There's a reason, like, I don't know anyone who actually read the instructions on the new Super Mario, which is a brilliant sure. game. Or the new Zelda, which is a brilliant game in a completely different direction. Because games have their own language. I'm playing Link, and I'm doing these specific things, and here's how Link's world works, and I'm playing him. I'm not playing Brooks. I'm playing Link. Sure. And VR is that next step where we actually get to put ourselves in that position. And so uh, after a few years of working for you know the craziest, most amazing job in the world, uh, and everyone's like, why would you leave Avatar? Uh, <laughs> Uh, Bo Anderson, uh, the CEO of Starbreeze, approached me. He's like, look, I, I like what you have to say. I think you kind of know what you're doing. Uh, would you like to head up all of our VR content? And uh, how do I say no to that? Sure. So uh, I've been at Star Starbreeze ever since, and it's been a, a crazy, psychotic, wonderful, amazing, horrible, wonderful journey. <laughs> uh, as kind as anyone in VR would attest, because you know the fun part about VR is that no one knows what they're doing. Sure. You know, if I go out and I make a Xbox One game and I'm making a first-person shooter, I get to stand on the shoulders of giants. I can go, cool. I'm making one like Halo, and Halo is based off this game, and it's sure. off this game, and we're standing on the shoulders of shoulders of shoulders. But if I were to say, cool, I want to make a game uh, where 
you actually get to experience what it's like to be in a war crime in Syria, as an example. Sure. Uh, and you have to save people's lives. There is no rule book. There's nothing that I stand on. It's, it's literally every single step. Every single step. We have to figure out everything we're doing. And it's, sure. it's one of those crazy moments that happens that that's the most exciting and terrifying thing that there is. And I guess I enjoy being excited and terrified. No, sure. No, I love that, man. I, I think that's great um, how you, you, you're, you get passionate about that. But I, I want to just, before we dive more into the VR side and kind of your, your day-to-day kind of role, I want to give a little bit of an overview of kind of the types of games that Starbreeze has put out and is going to put out in kind of the near future because I think it's worth mentioning and you guys have put out some some really cool games in kind of a bunch of different kind of uh, genres. Yeah, so Starbreeze has a great and very, we'll say, colorful and interesting history. I find it every time I, I sit and I listen to uh, Mikhail Nearmark, who's been around effectively from the beginning, or Bo Anderson, you sure. know, CEO, the COO, and Manu, our CTO, they have these war stories, and I love hearing them because it's such an odd journey. You know, really, Starbreeze, Starbreeze made its stripes in the licensing world. Okay. Uh, it's a game I loved, and I think everyone loved, which is the Chronicles of Riddick. That was the yeah. first, like, breakout hit that made Starbreeze. And they made a lot of licensed games. They did very well for it, but it was a work-for-hire studio. It's really tough as a work-for-hire studio to sort of keep the lights on, and it's sure. not a super fun thing. So, uh, you know, the, the fable goes, and I don't know if I necessarily believe the story, but I like it, so I, <laughs> I repeat it, is that they were, all, they were all sitting around, and one of them said they were sick of it, and they said, why don't we just rob a bank? And that's the genesis of Payday. Interesting. And so they created this original, this original concept of, what if these four guys just robbed a bank? You know, no story, no, no bullshit, no other stuff. Just the fun of robbing a bank. What is heat? Let's put people in heat, uh, which is a great movie. Sure, sure. And, and let's, let's have fun with it. And so they did. They made this game called Payday and took a sort of, you know, wild dive to make it happen. And it did quite well for them. Sure. And then they did Payday 2, and it did extremely well. I think, uh, you know, we're breaking significant numbers of players. We're top 10 concurrent players on steam we're doing very well wow congrats that's that's awesome and, actually and so it gave them a chance to start branching out and doing other stuff you know that that stuff you can't do when you're a work for hire studio like sure. publishing yeah. or or doing other sort of smaller titles so they did this uh, a brother a tale of two sons is an example of a published game okay um which you know did you know financially did fine but critically was a darling i loved i loved it and over time, they started to, you know, build more and more relationships and figure out more and more. So, like, right now, you know, it's grown from, let's figure, let's just rob a bank, and it's like <laughs> that level, all the way to where we're publishing, you know, System Shock 3, Psychonauts 2. Uh, it, we have this entire VR wing, which is, you know, my entire job and nightmare. And uh, we have a, we have, we, we've built our own headset uh, for VR, which is, uh, no tiny task at all, and thinks crazy smart people. Oh, I can imagine, and I want to cover that uh, in a bit. But keep and going. then, and then, uh, then they start making. Uh, you know, we just uh, showed off the announcement big trailer recently for The Walking Dead. Yeah, very uh, cool. which is our big. You know, I don't want to call it our big baby because that makes it sound simple and small, but uh, it is definitely a baby to this company, and everyone really, really cares about really knocking out of the park because it's you know co-ops what we do and who doesn't love the walking dead. So it's kind of like a great, it, it's super fulfilling to be able to work on and create this crazy game. So, uh, it's, it's, it's a really fun history and a really great sort of ride. And I'm sure there's a million more stories they would tell about how hilarious and terrifying and sad and wonderful game development is <laughs> that I think every developer can pretty much relate to at one point or another. Sure. Yeah. Whether you're in games or software or tech or hardware, I, it's the same kind of pains just for different types of projects, right? So I, I totally get that. Yep, exactly. So Exactly. So I really want to kind of dive in on kind of your side, the virtual reality space, because I think for me and I think a lot of people listening, you know, VR has been kind of getting a lot more publicity, lots more um, studios and, and people are actually focusing on 
building VR and, and you guys are actually building your own headset. So walk us through kind of all the stuff that you guys are doing in VR, because I think it's completely fascinating to me. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a ton of stuff. Uh, I can talk mostly about the projects we've announced. Okay. Some sure. really great things. Um, uh, we have a, a hero, okay. uh, which we announced uh, last uh, spring, sure. which is what I talked about. The concept it's, it's, for me, what I consider to be uh, sort of the direction I want VR to go, which is the concept of how we can make people feel emotional moments to sort of give them empathy and sort of change their perspective on the world. So we put you in a market in Syria uh, and you experience a war crime and people around you die and are injured. And it's your job to save people's lives or not. Like you don't have to. And it's a fairly intense experience. We tried to go for realism far over arcadiness, really to help people understand what it's like to be there. And we're working with uh, uh, Ink Stories and David Kansari on that. Uh, they're the developers and creative brains behind the whole thing, and they're just killing it, to be perfectly frank. Uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, our friends at Sundance uh, asked us to go there this year, so Hero will be at Sundance, which we're very excited about. Congrats, man. That's, that's uh, we amazing. Have eight, that, yeah, on the much more fun side, because, uh, you know, Syrian war crimes are not exactly very fun. Uh, on the other side of things, we have games like uh, Apex. Our friends at Lucky Hammers, uh, we're publishing that. Uh, and you're a giant cybernetic monkey on top of a giant tower. Sure. And you're punching at drones and shooting drones. More of a classic arcade but still a storytelling piece. Sure. And it really takes advantage of our headset because we have that giant field of view. Uh, and we've had people in it over the last like two months We've had a number of people who are significantly fear, fearful of heights, and they simply can't do the game. Really? Uh, because unlike the Vive, the, the Vive is very much that sort of binocular vision. You're looking yeah. straight forward. Yeah, yeah, the moment yeah. you introduce full field of view, you can look straight forward. You can still see the edge of the damn building. <laughs> so ah, I see. It's, it's, it's pretty intense uh, and really fun to sort of watch people play. Uh, we have another game called The Raft, done by Red Games, uh, out of Red Interactive, an agency and here in L.A. Uh, wonderful group. Uh, the Raft is our first real foray into the concept of sort of cooperative four-player gaming. Okay. Uh, rather than putting people against each other, uh, the idea comes from and is inspired from games like Guns of Icarus, which is one of my favorite cooperative games I ever played. Uh, and in The Raft, it's very similar. In The Raft, you're uh, one of four uh, rednecks traveling down the Mississippi River in a sort of ramshackle, uh, hastily built raft. And these creatures that are made of the digital world are slowly taking over your land. Okay, and cool. you're trying to kill them. And sure. they're trying to kill you. And <laughs> so, of course, a couple of people have guns. One person's driving. As the boat catches fire, one person needs to grab a fire team and put it out. Another person needs to be grabbing the turrets to take on some of the bigger enemies. There's just enough stuff that no one is able to do only one thing the whole time. Oh, interesting. Uh, so it's kind of designed, and it's, it's really fun, and it's very much designed in that direction. Uh, we're trying to find that balance because everything we do is very location-based. We don't build for the home audience at all. Sure. Uh, so what we've seen is the, the people who go out are oddly diverse. There's groups of guys like me who are hardcore VR enthusiasts, Others are like date night, the guy and his girlfriend, and the guy may have played games, the girl may have not, sure. or vice versa, uh, or families, where it's a mom and dad and their kids who are 10, yeah. and they all want to play together. Sure. So how do you build something for all of these people? Wow. And wow. the rap is the first attempt to solve that, and it's uh, so far in our playtesting, it's been pretty successful, and we're really excited to launch it next month. That's great, so That'll man. be great. That's, that's awesome. So... Uh, uh, no, keep going. Sorry, and I, I I'm not done. Sorry, oh, we're no, doing no, too many going. things. It's good. It's good. Uh, uh, we've got we've we've also got a, a great format called Presence, uh, which is our volumetric sort of light field esque, but not light field, uh, uh, cinematic format. It's 100 percent pre rendered, but it's film quality CG that you can walk around, uh, and it's really trippy uh, the first time you do it. Okay. And so we're working with uh, different film studios on trying to bring content to that. We have a piece we did with a Blur out of Los Angeles and Kevin Margo, who directed it, uh, called Construct. Uh, okay. You're welcome to come out and check it out anytime in L.A. Uh, I'm actually going to be at the uh, Media that, Awards, that's but that I would can... be amazing. <laughs>
we will, we will definitely have to do that for yes. sure. And it, you know, we have a, we have a bunch of other stuff uh, that we haven't quite announced yet okay. no, uh, that's totally that we're really fair. excited about. Uh, yeah. So I'll just, I'll hold myself there before my PR person uh, sort of screams at me. <laughs> no, 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 fair enough. You, you covered a lot of stuff and I think it gives a, a good kind of overview of kind of what you guys are doing and then we can just leave it at more stuff coming in the near future. <laughs> um, so it sounds good. So you mentioned kind of a little bit before that you guys are building your own headset. What exactly are you guys kind of doing with that? And why did you decide to build one? Because I've played with kind of the Oculus and the Vive and even the ones where you just the the cheap ones that you stick your phone in and you, you know, your Android or iPhone and you move around in, in Google's cardboard or whatever. But so what walk me through kind of that whole kind of evolution and why you guys decided to do that? Well, it's it's one of those things that, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons I really was happy to join Starbreeze. Uh, it's a weird mix of business and gamer mentality, because sure. uh, we're all fairly hardcore gamers. I'm the kind of person who's like got 900 hours in Rust and 3,000 hours in Dota 2. Sure, sure. Uh, but at the same time, like, I've done way too many contracts and licensing deals and all these things. So there's a weird balance we could struck at Starbreeze. And so what happened is they had a chance to, they looked at, the home market and they had the same thought i did i didn't know them at the time but you know i saw the oculus and the vibe coming and i was i was excited for them as a gamer sure. but my business brain was like there's no way that takes off it's excessively complicated you have to build a significantly powerful computer to run it and you yeah. need an entire room dedicated to it to actually get that totally. experience yeah. that is really promised yeah. and the pain in the ass is it's a very american-centric way of looking at it most people in the world don't have a room to dedicate. I'm fortunate that my wife has, even after the birth of our new son, <laughs> I got to keep my, uh, I call it my office. Sure. Uh, but it's, it's my game room. Sure, sure. Uh, well, they're, and they're one of the and same she knows that, that's fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm lucky, but I'm lucky that I have one of those. Yep. Most yeah, people yeah. in the world will never have that. Sure. And on top of that, if you do have furniture, if you have other things, the reality is, you know, headsets are, five years away from being able to do crazy stuff with understanding what furniture is where or how objects interact and all these things. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be conquered. So it's really cool from a gamer perspective, not so much for us from like, this is not really going to be as big. And then conversely, you have the opposite. You have the the mobile market, which is going to be everywhere, but it's going to deliver experiences that are significantly downgraded from the home version. Sure. And so we saw this middle road that no one was taking, which is, what if we don't care about, you know, you can have the most powerful damn PC in the world, and we can have the most expensive headset in the world, and we do it because we only go for location-based. It's 100% about arcade, theme parks, uh, straight down the road. Interesting. Uh, so it doesn't matter what our headset costs, because we don't have to worry about what it costs on the shelf at Best Buy. We don't have to care about how good or literate you are with computers because you don't have to set it up. You come in, you give me $10, and you play a game. Interesting. And that kind of, that kind of concept uh, ballooned into finding these guys called Infinidi out of Paris. Okay. And uh, they were developing a 5K headset uh, that had the 210-degree field of view. And, you know, our North Star from the beginning of VR, I think, if I had to guess the mindset of our our dear leaders is we want to make payday in real life. Like we want four dudes to be able to go into a bank and rob it and shoot a bunch of cops and not have to be teleporting around, which works now. It works great. We did that in payday too. So a bunch of VR people can play it, but it's not the same as a full bank. So how do you do that? Well, one of the big problems is without a field of view, you can't really run. Uh, you, You can, you're welcome to try it, (laughs) <laughs> but you trip over your feet surprisingly often because you'd be surprised at how much your brain actually processes of the stuff you're not seeing. Yeah, What's right in front of you is what your brain processes that you know about it, but all this information is going in that stops you from being off balance, your feet tripping over each other, seeing your friends, seeing the guy next to you you don't want to run into, and all that stuff's really important for like arena esports or like that future of VR that I think everyone really does have as their North Star. Sure. And so that challenge and that and figuring that out is kind of the sort of big setup around the whole thing. And so we charged straight down that way. We grabbed IMAX. We said, hey, we want to do some arcades. They said, hey, we do too. So we helped open up the first VR arcade with IMAX uh, in L.A. Very cool. And we've been partners with them since. And we've got a whole bunch of stuff coming in a lot of other locations that we're really excited about because we see 
the chance for people, especially all over the world from, you know, Dubai to China to Tokyo to, you know, Chicago, it's much easier to spend 20 bucks and go play some amazing VR than it is to spend 3000 Sure. And hope that you know how to set it up. Yeah. So that's uh, kind of the direction we ended up going. No, that's very cool. So the heart, like, does just so I'm clear, the, the headset plugs into, like, a, a PC gaming computer, like a high-end one? Is is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So our, our partner is Acer. Uh, StarVR is a partnership between Starbreeze and Acer, uh, okay. the computer and laptop manufacturer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so they supply all of our PCs, so we get... It's, it's one of the nice parts about it is, sure. especially for developers, uh, going to them and saying that, you know, what computer do you need rather than telling them, okay, you have to make it work on a 980G GX and only sure. that. And it can't work on anything fast. It's, it, instead, it's, cool, how many, how many 1080 Ti's do you want in SLI? What, what, what do you want to run? <laughs> and so you can really push pixels. You can really have fun as an artist. Sure. And it also means that we get to have these crazy computers that, you just will never have it home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And on totally. top of that, the LBE thing is really fortunate because one of the big challenges that the home VR market really runs into is the same as the home console market. The moment you release the next one, the old one is crap and no one wants it. Yeah. Uh, and so suddenly you have this weird division, people who have the first five and then the second, and what about this one and does this stuff work with that and this controller with that thing? But with our setup, we, you know, our headset, we're not keeping it. If I, we have a huge roadmap, we're able to, you know, replace all of them because we don't have to worry about everyone having one in their homes. Right. And just like that, when the next NVIDIA card comes out, you know, the 1190 or 4080 or whatever they end up calling the next thing, sure, sure. we just swap all, swap all the computers and suddenly we've got whatever's needed to run the damn thing. Interesting. That's a totally new approach. I, I love it. I think that's... That's really cool, man. So do you know, like, when that's kind of coming? Or is it kind of there? Or, like, what, when can people actually go check some of this stuff out? So the, you can go check it out generally at any IMAX VR center. Uh, okay. It goes in and out. We have different content popping in and out. Uh, you know, VR centers operate very similarly to movie theaters. Sure. So, uh, you know, after something's been out for six or seven months, they want the new hotness in. And we're replacing our hotness pretty regularly. Uh, so generally speaking, Star VR is around there. Okay. Uh, uh, you can also, if you're part of the development community, don't hesitate to hit me up on LinkedIn. Happy to do demos generally anytime. Very cool. Uh, but otherwise, we're you know we're working with movie theaters, mall chains, uh, theme parks, all kinds of things all over the world. And really, I think 2018 is going to be our big year. Uh, it's been a lot of. You know, people haven't heard much about us, and it's been very much on purpose because we've been needing to sit back. Sure. Uh, it's one of the bonuses of working for a Swedish company rather than an American one, uh, which I'm very used to. American companies are always about, get up there, all the PR you can, hype it up, hype it up for 17 <laughs> years before you release anything. But, but, you know, you do a lot of hype. But the Swedish company and mentality around the whole thing instead is, no, we need to see what we need to do figure it out and we've spent a great deal of time in R&D uh, tons of time in me mechanical R&D for the headset controller R&D learning how to build things like you know footballs like literal footballs that you throw interesting as an example uh, rather than a Vive controller which we intend to have a similar thing to that but you know there's something like in John Wick we have uh, we actually have you holding a real MP5 it's real in every way except the ways that matter Sure. And that changes how you play a game. In uh, The Mummy, we have a real M4, except it's not a really a real M4. It's just the stock and barrel. Right. Uh, so it feels like one. Interesting. Uh, and then, in, like I just mentioned, the raft. Yeah. How do you do a fire extinguisher? Well, it's easy. You do a fire extinguisher. Sure. <laughs> so how do you, literally, how, you, how do you make a fire extinguisher the track? Or in uh, Hero, how do you make... how do you make rebar and human skin that feels real? So people, when they reach over they aren't reaching over with a vibe controller and missing everything, but how do you make sure that they feel and tactically have the sensation that they are in the location they're at? Because the number one thing that is the rule of VR uh, above all, and it's really the same about any really medium is the give a mouse a cookie theory. The moment you start giving a person any level of reality, they start pushing that sure. and they push it until it, they push it until it breaks. And then the moment they know it breaks, that's where they know the rules end, and they're able to see, okay, 
the game works from here to here. Here's my boundaries. But that's not how reality works. You can push it. It's what we do when we're babies. We push and push and push, and reality kind of keeps going. Sure. And the more we're able to play in that kind of space where when you reach out and you touch a rock, it feels like a rock, and it's the shape of the rock that you expect, and it's in the location you expect, and you have these tactile moments, that drives you deeper into believing this experience that you're in. It's a uh, smell is one of those things that uh, I laughed off the first time I heard about NVR. Uh, and then after doing it, I felt like I was an idiot uh, <laughs> because what I, what I learned is in the ugliest unity demo I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, what you can do is uh, if you smell blades of grass and you look down and they're shitty blades of grass, you don't see shitty blades of grass. Yeah, you see yeah, blades yeah. of grass. Sure. It's a very small difference, but it, the smell of a thing makes you believe you're there. And suddenly this horrible dragon flies overhead, but it doesn't matter because you smell the charcoal and the fire on its breath. Right. And it's there. Like it's there. And then the more you allow a person to experience reality, the more they believe it. And that's one of the really fascinating things about VR because as people start becoming more immersed in something like the raft, but especially something like Hero, where we're able to tell these dramatic moments the more that you're able to actually affect them as if it was real. Sure. No, I, I, that's that's actually interesting. The, the smell thing is, how do you even, like, build that, though? Like, are you guys are you guys building that part as well? Or are you just focusing you, on the you wouldn't You wouldn't even, yeah, no, we're, we're totally, we're, we totally have all of these things built. That's for experience. You know, the raft doesn't have any smells sure. because that's not really what's required for it. The hero definitely does. Gotcha. And the thing I've learned that I didn't know is you can actually order a smell online called Chart Corpse. Okay, interesting. <laughs> yeah, so these, like, they're, all of these things are, it's, it's one of the reasons I'm really encouraged by VR where it's at now versus, uh, you know, I like when I, whenever I do talks, I always bring up the fact that everyone pretends VR is a new technology, but it's not. It's older than I am, sure. and the promise is older than I am. And it's a promise that's been bullshit every single time. Uh, and where we're at now is all of these technologies are actually starting to exist from really, really complicated smell machines that are really tiny and we're able to have inside of really, really crazy spaces all the way to sensor technology, motion capture technology, uh, you know, rendering technology, thanks to Unreal and Unity's work. Things are as beautiful as they can possibly be. We're way far ahead. We're in a really good spot to do some really powerful things. No, I, I, I love that. I, I think that's completely fascinating to me. But I, I'm curious then, for people that are looking to get into kind of VR and, and maybe like almost have your job one day, like because in a lot of cases, I think people would think that what you're, you're doing is kind of their dream job, especially if they're you know about to kind of maybe go to school or, or start in the industry. What advice do you kind of give people that are kind of up and coming and, and what should they kind of learn and focus on and, and get passionate about? It's the easiest thing in the world. We're very fortunate that anyone who wants to get in the industry now, we have this amazing thing called the Internet. And while we had the Internet when I was trying to get in, we didn't have the Internet like we have today. Right now, if you want to go, if you want to say to yourself, I have an idea for a VR game. Uh -huh. You can go learn how to make it and you can learn it in Unreal for free or you for free, it costs you nothing except for even having a kind of cheap, crappy computer is possible. Sure. And you can actually dive in and you can learn how to do this. And it's the kind of thing that if you dedicate yourself to time, in six months, you will have a portfolio by nature of just diving into it that most VR places will hire you. Interesting. They're just, just it's, it's fascinating. Uh, you know, the reality is there's a ton of people looking for work in VR. And uh, a ton of developers wanting to do VR. But we always ask the same question. Uh, it's the same question in both cases. People give us pitches. People want to work for us. The answer is, the question is always, why VR? Uh, okay. For experiences, you know, we get, God, I've got like a thousand pitches since I started at Starbreeze. Everyone's like, oh, finance my game. Here's my game. Here's the idea. And so we always make them answer, you know, why VR as part of the pitch. Okay. And uh, the, the big problem you run into is a lot of people don't have a good reason. A lot of their experiences would be just as good or actually better as console games or movies. Interesting. Because they're not really paying attention to the medium. It's the medium that matters. 
the same way that there are some games that just should be movies and there are some movies that just should be books. Uh, Some things are really designed for a certain medium and VR is no different. And so when you go in for an interview, having a chance to actually work on VR, having a chance to actually play in it and really having a passion for it gives you a significant leg up because a lot of people just want to get into it because the truth is they see a lot of money in it. And, you know, that's fair. VR is one of those weird explosive things that's happening. Uh, I believe there's a crunch coming, but everyone has their own opinion. But everyone wants to jump in. So if you're actually passionate about VR, you can learn how to do it. Yeah. And you can probably have a job within six to nine months. Sure. So start making VR. <laughs> it's basically. <laughs> yeah. like Basically just start doing it. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's an old, uh, I, I can't remember who it was, a film studio head when I was younger. Uh, same thing was asked to him. How do you, what do you say to people getting into film? And he said, I would say, go buy a camcorder. And I would say, go start making movies. Sure. Because you can now. Yeah. And that was something he didn't have when he was younger. And now you guys have something I didn't have when I was younger. Sure. So it's the same. I'm, I guess I'm the old person. Great. That's no. a realization I had during this. Thank you for that. <laughs> no, but I, I think the, the thing is just to kind of reiterate your point. It's like there's been entire movies that have made it to Sundance or even in certain theaters that have been shot entirely on an iPhone. And it's like, most people yeah. nowadays can get a computer that's, you know, a few hundred dollars or maybe a grand or, or something like that, that, and maybe even a cheap VR headset to, and you download free open source kind of software or like free version of these software and actually start building this stuff. Right. And you're right. Yes. Like, and there is a million YouTube tutorials. Sure. If you want to know how to make VR, Google, I want to make VR in unreal. Mm-hmm. And there are 40 different, tutorial full tutorials like hundreds of hours sure. of video that you can watch to learn how to do all of these different little things and if it doesn't if it isn't there and you get something that's complicated first off congratulations you're an actual developer sure second off there are pe- there are places online you can go ask facebook groups google groups sure. forums all kinds of stuff where you can go hey i don't know how to do x and you'll have 50 people giving you an answer on how to do that thing it's it's utterly astounding you know when i've heard I owe Unreal. Uh, I have to just give that caveat because I mentioned it a lot. Sure. I owe Unreal, and so does my little brother, our gaming careers. Because both of us wanted to get in games very, very badly, and neither of us were in it. And so we spent like six, six, ten months. We bought every book in Unreal because they weren't on the internet. Sure. Uh, and we sat and we did it. And my brother will say, and I'll say the same thing, the demos we made out of that and the experience of that made us the developers we are today because you just do it. Sure. And you're going to suck, and it's awful. The first few months are just like the worst, worst feeling in the world because you sure. feel so stupid. And if you don't feel stupid, congratulations, you're way smarter than me. <laughs> uh, but the reality is you're going to feel dumb, but you push through it, you're, you're on the same playing level as most of us. Uh, in the next year, we're still in that phase that we're in now where there's no rules, there's no standard of doing things. It's tougher if you want to get in and make a Gears of War for Xbox One because there's a million rules, gigantic development teams, all of that. But right now, the best VR, hands down, is being made by small teams. It's 7 to 15 minutes, and they're powerful experiences. You can do that. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great, man, and that's inspiring. And I love people like the, like yourself that openly talk about this stuff and basically say like the first few months of this stuff is going to be terrible and to be fair and you don't have to but like even probably some of your day to day now is terrible like you don't have the best days every no, we day we have we have right? games we have games we have games you're never going to hear about sure <laughs> like sure. this is the reality is no one knows what works in VR right now and if no one's trying, we're not going to advance. Everything is going to be a freaking arena shooter for the rest of our lives. <laughs> sure. And so, you know, if you sit on the right forums and you download, there's a million games on Steam that are VR, a million. Yeah. And most of them are absolutely awful. But in every single one of them, there's something interesting someone's trying. And you can sure. tell yep. that most of them. I shouldn't say all of them because some of them are absolute garbage. But you know, there's a lot of people trying and they're like, here's this thing. The game kind of sucks, but I figured out how to do, you know, a weird locomotion. I played a game where you're on the back of a turtle and the controller, you're holding a stick with a carrot on the end of it. And the turtle follows it. And he was trying to invent a new way of locomotion in VR. Interesting. I don't think it worked. 
I don't think it works, but I damn well bought the game because that's the kind of stuff we need to support. Because who knows? Maybe someone like that, someone like that's going to crack it. I always go back and I talk about uh, the Great Train Robbery, fantastic okay. movie, yeah, uh, and really the beginning of film. So movies, when they first started, were about ten minutes long. They were a single flat shot. It was very similar to going and watching a play because it would just take place on the stage in front of you. And then this movie called The Great Train Robbery did this really weird thing called a dolly move. That's where they put a camera on a thing that moved during the shot. And then there's the second thing called an edit where they actually splice two incongruent pieces of film together to jump you from one scene to another. I know it sounds crazy, but bear with me. Sure, what sure. ended up happening is everyone at the time, and you can go back and you can read reviews, people were furious. Oh, audiences <laughs> are going to be disoriented. It's awful. And it's like all this, but like that, those two things are things children do right now in iMovie on Max. Yeah, yeah, They're yeah. part of our normal everyday language, and they helped invent what film is. So in the next couple of years, we're going to have someone figure out what our dolly move is or what our edit is. And they're neither of those things. But there's something that is going to crack what makes VR an actual entertainment experience, a storytelling experience, and it's going to be some dude. Really, it's going to be some dude on his computer, and it's probably going to be some terrible game on Steam uh, that hopefully I'll be fortunate enough to play and figure out that he, he was onto something. <laughs> no, I, I love that, man. And, and, and that's actually a really good reference, right? Because nothing moves forward without people trying things and kind of failing, right? And even if you just like, oh, I'll never do that again, or I'll, I definitely need to do that again. And you, you put enough of the, oh, I should do that again together, and you get something great, right? And I think that's, that's really 100%. Cool. So we're, we're kind of coming to the end of the show. And I, and I really want to talk about kind of the Media X Awards, you guys are a sponsor of it. And why did you kind of decide to get kind of involved with, with Sarah and the Media Excellence Awards? Well, it's, it's one of those things that uh, there are VR awards and then there are media excellence awards. And sure. I, I don't want to specifically use that name, but there are media awards and there are VR awards. Okay. One of the things I find troubling in general is that VR has very much sectioned itself off from a lot of media. Okay. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the traditional media people are starting to really get an interest in VR. Uh, the, the people, random happenstance encounters I've had in L.A. because it's Hollywood. Sure. Uh, and just suddenly talking to random celebrity X about VR or meeting with, you know, uh, Hollywood executive person X about VR, they're starting to understand that, that the way that you need to make movies is the way that James Cameron always talked about, which is sure. you're building a world. Yeah. And the more we can encourage that VR is not this other thing, it is not a gaming platform. I, I cannot tell you how much I just shudder every time I hear that. It is not a gaming platform. It is a platform to enable people to have recontextualization of their life experiences inside of a virtual world. And that power is something that we're going to start cracking. And we need to be part of the film and TV and games industry, but we're all three of those. Interesting. So we need to make sure that we stay with those things rather than yeah. branching off just because we want to pat ourselves on the back with another award. I'm not a big fan of award shows in general, but... It's the kind of thing that if we're able to, you know, start showing people, hey, you can do storytelling in VR. It doesn't have to just be shooty, gamey things. Sure. Or it doesn't have to be crazy, weird, artistic stuff either. There's a middle ground. We can do some interesting stuff. And we think, like, it's why we, uh, you know, Apex was uh, chosen as a nominee this year. Uh, we were really happy to see that. That's one of the reasons we went, all right, let's give this a shot. Because, sure. you know, Apex, we've, we've done... A, we, we call it Pixar or DreamWorks like storytelling. Yeah. It's still got some gamey elements, some storytelling elements. And we think it's a powerful, fun experience, especially for people who like that sort of genre of things. So, you know, you never know, but it's definitely an encouraging sign to see. No, I, that's great, man. I, I love that. And I love, I, I 100% agree with you. I, I think it's very much a part of, of that industry. And I also think I'm really curious to see about you know, when it makes itself kind of running in the browser. I know we're a ton of, we're probably a number of years out from that, but 
just kind of how you interact with even just like the web, if that's a thing ever, like just kind of where it's going is the whole thing's kind of fascinating to me, right? And and maybe at some point like VR and AI kind of come in together. I, I don't know, but it could be really cool, right? No, so, no, it, it's it's literally that VR, VR is this super unique medium in the sense that you allow a user to do anything inside of a virtual world. And that can have, any meaning that there is. And sure. so I'm really against the idea of pulling VR into games or only into movies or only into this. It, VR enables me to experience the world in a very unique way. And so we need people who know how to make movies. We need people who know sure. how to build worlds. We need people who know how to write books and comic books and artists and all these things because it's going to take everyone to figure out how to turn this medium into something that's truly palatable to the average person when we get out there. No, I, and we're not far away from that. No, I 100% agree with you, man. That's that's really great. And sadly, we're out of time. And so let's close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and uh, Starbreeze Studios. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, Just Google Starbreeze anytime. Starbr.com about our headset. Uh, and we have a bunch of announcements coming. We're on Twitter and Instagram and all kinds of stuff. Uh so it's, there's all kinds of things that are happening. Of course, uh, the easiest way to follow anything we do is to join our, the largest Steam community in the world, which is Payday 2. Uh, we kind of announce everything to our ultra fans and those guys who are with us first. So sure. feel free to join that community or buy the game. Of course, buy Payday 2. Perfect. <laughs> no, that's Happy great, to get man. the plug in there. Sure, sure. No, that's great, man. Well, Brooks, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to seeing you in... LA in uh, on January 18th and uh, thanks again for doing this and uh, have a good rest of your day oh thanks it's always fun and again like I said I could talk about this stuff for hours so it definitely gave me something good to do it was a great chat yeah that's great man all right we'll talk soon thank you hey thanks thanks for listening please visit the show's website at buildingthefutureshow.com Also check us out on Facebook at Building the Future Show and follow us on Twitter at Building Show. The music for the show is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.